these truck drivers in here going to jerk a knot in my butt about my air brake drawing, but I'll do the best I can. Get on this side. So in the, in the previous little uh, diagram, you know, we're come, we've got air coming out of the engine compressor going to the dryer. That dryer feeds air to the wet tank. Let me back up for a second. Sorry about this. We're skipping around. How many of you have heard on your own coach or beside an uh, air brake vehicle at a red light? Uh, Compressor has compressor on the engine is an odd kind of compressor in that it actually runs all the time whether you need pressure or not. Because it's hard geared to the engine, it runs all the time. But there is a control mechanism, two small airlines that come from the bottom of the air dryer back to the compressor that when air is not required, you're above 90 PSI, it just pumps air to the atmosphere. That compressor free breathes. When you dip below 90, it closes off the circuit, and now you're building pressure, and you will build pressure to 120, and then it will cut off. When it reaches 120 is when you hear the whoosh. And what that whoosh is, is not only the release of that pressure, but there is a air-operated valve on the bottom of that dryer that if the dryer has accumulated any moisture, it's going to spit it out. I'm telling you about this because we're talking about fundamentals of air system problems. If you are idling and you can build no pressure, the first place to look is that valve to make sure it's not jammed open because the compressor is just free breathing at that point in time and you won't build any pressure. And they do get jammed from time to time. Especially in cold weather. They will freeze. So we go to the wet tank. Wet tank comes up and it splits and, it's, and and there's some manifolding in here. I've drawn an overly simplified schematic of how it really is. But in principle, it goes to the primary and secondary tank. So here's your first air brake question for the non-truck drivers. Which axle is the primary braking on a coach and which is the secondary? Front primary. The front is the secondary. Um, it is exactly backwards to an automobile. Where all of the braking on an automobile, you know what, 60, 70 percent of the braking is with the front wheels. It is backwards. It may be even 80 percent of the braking is on the rear tires of a coach. Very little of it is actually on the front tires. Is it the tag axle or is it the drive axle? It, on the new old, it's, it's supposed to be the drive, the way it's set up. I think that the tag axle version of the front axle are both close to the same size. And then you have a much bigger work on the drive. My drive axle pads were not with us. So here's the way it works. We've got 120 pounds of pressure in the primary tank. Its sole purpose is to have a large reservoir of compressed air to operate the primary brakes. There is a big ass airline that comes off of that tank and goes all the way to the back to the air brake relay, and we're going to talk about that in a second. But just, there is a great big line that comes off that tank. Big line meaning you move a lot of air real fast. 
there is a smaller airline that comes up to the brake pedal valving at your foot. And when you step on the brake pedal, you open an air circuit that provides pressure out of the brake pedal and because it's in a very small diameter line, it builds pressure quickly. And it, that small air line feeds into this air brake relay, which is located in the ceiling directly above the drive axle. And just like we talked about electrical relays yesterday, this is a pneumatic relay. As soon as it sees this pressure, it opens a big diaphragm which opens this great big line from the primary over to the mechanism that actuates the brake shoes, where they be cam or disc. Where they be the old school brake shoes or where they be disc calipers, it doesn't matter. This is how it works. As soon as you let off on the brake pedal, this pressure goes away and there is a mechanism in this brake relay that exhausts all the air in this line immediately. If it didn't work that way, let's talk about what would happen. Air pressure, unlike electricity, air is compressible. So if you waited from pressure to build from the brake pedal through 40 feet of the air line, to the brake shoes, it would be a while after you put on the brakes before they actually applied themselves. And consequently, after you let off on the brake pedal, if this relay valve weren't in here, it would take some time for that pressure to go away so your brakes would stay on long after you wanted them to go away. So that's the purpose of the relay valve. And when you let off on the brakes, you hear the that's the air being released at the relay valve. Now, the, the way in the mules that I have spent some time under, there is a second relay valve that is tandem to this one with a small airline. And that relay valve does the very same thing for the tag brakes. And based on what I've seen from some coaches, I, it is my feeling that the engineers at Newell have the incorrect size of relay valve right here. And that they are putting too much air too quickly to the tag brakes. And you're yet another day point. Too many people skidding tag tires, too many people with tags that get smoking hot and stopping no traffic. It, I think this, and these valves come in different sizes and they come in different, what people refer to as crack pressures. Not crack heads, but crack pressures. And what the crack pressure means is how much pressure does it see before it opens? All right, what's the symptom of um, that valve being too, too small? I mean, how would I know Skits, from the driver's uh, seat? Skid, skidding the tag tires and panic stop or in stop and go traffic, the dang whole assembly getting so hot you can't put your hands on the ramps. So shouldn't they be opening the same pressure? Is, is that where you're going? I am not an air brake engineer, but I just know that this problem exists and that's the most likely cause. Wrong. That's what I was saying. Are they, can you change, can you come up with some kind of... You, you can buy a relay valve that is going to open at a higher crack pressure. Well, I know mine I'm just coming down here down. My tag, just, if I use the brakes in it all, it puts air in the tag, I'm monitoring the air temperature in the wheel and it gets up 185, 100. Yeah, your, yours is the worst case I've ever seen. <laughs> All right. Sure. Front brake on the secondary circuit. So 
So there is an air line coming out of the secondary tank that goes to that brake pedal valve. And when you press on the brake pedal, out of that air line at the brake pedal, air goes to the front brakes. What is missing in this circuit? Relay. Relay. So it takes a lot longer for the front brakes to kick in. And actually the brake pedal is set up that you really have to be pressing on it pretty hard before you even get air in the circuit. Now, there's some all kinds of inner widgets in this brake pedal valve assembly so that if something goofy happened and a rock went through your primary tank, it will take air from the secondary tank and feed it through this pedal so that you still have stopping. And it, it will cross over the tanks automatically. I didn't say it would be seamless. You'll know something's wrong, but you'll still have, a, if you were to lose one of the primary or secondary tanks, not both, you can still come to a stop. Computing? Questions? Comments? With the, our system over hydraulic, you're going to come to a stop. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about uh, something I did not draw on this, but it's, it's something to uh, keep in mind because it, it, it is a fundamental difference between air brakes and car brakes. And that is the emergency brake system. If you lose the car engine, if it stops turning over, it's not the easiest thing in the world, but you can bring the car to a stop. Yes? Yes. If the engine dies in your coach and you have no air pressure, how do you apply brakes? <laughs> wait for it to get down to 60 PSI. You wait for it to get down to 60 PSI. But let's talk about, we'll talk about in details in a second, thank you for that, Michael, about how that works. But let's talk about the, the mechanical thing that makes it possible. On mounted at the corners of your axles, you will see something that is commonly referred to as a can. And it's a little bit bigger around than a coffee can, and it's kind of oblong shaped, and it's hooked to a bracket on the axle, or it's hooked to the calipers if you have disc brakes. And inside that can <coughs> is a rubber diaphragm. The air for applying the brakes comes in to this side of the diaphragm and right in the center of the diaphragm is a big honking steel rod. So when you apply air pressure here, the rod moves in that direction and it turns a cam or it moves the caliper and that's what puts the brakes on. As soon as you let off on that pressure, there's a small spring there and this comes back to neutral. Sweet on the rear drive axle. There is a second can bolted to the first can, but it has different innards to it. It has a diaphragm, but the air comes in this side. And on this side is a great big spring, a very strong spring a spring that will hurt you. If there's no air pressure here, and this rod that I'm talking about that moves back and forth extends out the back of this can and is attached to this diaphragm also. If there's no air pressure here in the green, 
this spring takes over and pushes the rod forward. And they are strong enough to stop the coach. When your e-brake, your yellow e-brake is pulled out, you are supplying air pressure to this green chamber. When it's pushed in, but thank you, George. When it's pushed in, you're supplying air to this chamber, which counteracts the spring force that puts the brake on. That yellow handle has some groovy design features in it so that if the air pressure in the system drops below 60 PSI, and that's a magic value, and it's the same value used in what valve? The pressure protection valve. So 60 PSI is a magic number to air brake engineers. Below 60 pounds, that yellow handle will pop out on its own. And when it pops out, you lose air pressure to that, the spring comes on and automatically puts your brakes on. It's also designed that if you can't build 60 pounds of pressure in the system, it won't let you turn the emergency brake off. And that's on purpose. You know, the Department of Transportation says, you know, if you don't have enough pressure to activate the brakes, we don't think it's a good idea for you to be driving around. So let's mandate something in the system to keep you from doing that. If you find yourself in a situation where you don't have air pressure but the coach has to move, you will find on the back side of this can, that second can, there's a little plastic fitting, open it up, there's a hole in there. And you should have attached to a bracket up here on the top a pretty good sized Allen wrench. And you put that Allen wrench in that hole and you start cranking down on that spring, pulling it to you. And it will take the spring pressure off the brakes. But be advised. As soon as you do that, there is no way to stop the coach. So if it's not tied to something, chopped to something, and it starts rolling, don't think you're going to jump in the door and apply the brakes because you have no air pressure. That is, you'll read that on the internet in different forms as caging the brake. Does the e-brake system make a little more sense to you now about how that works? Does it lock the brakes or does it apply the brakes? It applies the brakes. Okay. So uh, you're not going to like smoke and going down to 70 miles an hour? Uh, I think that's coach to coach dependent. I don't think you're going to, you're not going to lock up the tires. Okay. Um, and I wish mine were a little stronger because, and you can run this experiment sometime in a safe place. Uh, I can have my e-brake on, and if I give it, feed it a little bit of gas and drive, I can make the coach move. Hmm. I can't. That, that's a potential for a huge weight problem. There's a lot of good warnings on the back of that spring, by the way, on that outside of that canister. And for a guy that likes to think we shouldn't take it apart, I mean, that and that band goes around right there, There's a, read all those warnings, be aware that's That spring that's will death. hurt you. That's death. All right. So before you go forward, yeah. Um, so if you're driving down the road and you lose your engine air compressor, then your brakes are going to be applied and you're going to come to a stop in X number of feet. When you go, whether you want to or not, you get about seven brake pumps, right? I mean, it, 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 oh, it doesn't happen without you pumping the brake. Yeah. Or it it, ha it happens when your brake pressure when your drops goes below, below 60 pounds. Right. All right. Now, the ideal situation in the way it's supposed to work 
is you should have a low pressure alarm in your coach that comes on somewhere north of 60 pounds. It says you better get stopped and figure out what's going on or in a little while I'm going to stop you. You should have an audible alarm at 75. The GLT says you should have an audible as well as a visual and DOT also advises that you test all these systems. Yes, yes too. So if you got to replace that diaphragm that you're talking about, takes that spring. And, and, and you know those have to be replaced at times after heat. The heat all the mornings. All right. Well, you've you've suffered through that to get to the most controversial topic. I have just drawn one side of a six pack for simplicity's purpose. We'll get into some double sided intricacies in this in a second, but to understand what you really need to understand, yes, Mike. Before you get on to that back on the brakes. It seemed like there was a procedure when you start the coach that you should check your brakes by pumping them down or something like there that. There is a legal procedure that you're supposed okay. to go through. Can you repeat that, please? Uh, I'd rather not because I might give you inaccurate information. Oh, okay. There, somebody posted a good a video for a, yeah. a you, you, CHP officer. You, you can get a video if you Google it, Mike. And, and Basically, you're going to pump your brakes down, see if your audible comes on at 75. Then you're going to continue pumping them until 60, and all of a sudden your handle should come out. If it doesn't, you've just identified two problems. Okay. And, and it shouldn't be moved until those are fixed. Is that the engine off? Engine off. Engine off. That way you're arresting the top of your But you really ought to watch your video because there's multiple tests they talk about doing around there. So it's really good. It should build up at a certain rate. It should fail at a certain point. There's one other step in there that you, you, you start the truck, no, so you start the coach up, and you get your pressure up, and you shut it off, and you observe legal if you lost air pressure. Then you apply your brakes, hold your pedal down, and watch the loss of air pressure. And then the rest of it, like speaking, comes from that. So let me give you one caution when you start playing with fanning the brakes to drop the pressure. Don't stand on them. Don't press them hard, just fan them. The reason you don't stand on them is if you stand on them with the e-brake applied, you have the combined force of the spring and what the force you're putting on with the brake pressure, and you can bend or break something up here. It's called compounding. So you, it's not a problem to fan them to drop the pressure. Just don't grind down on the pedal when you do it. But good question, Mike. And uh, any of us who uh, should be going for some sort of modified CDL license would be required to know that procedure by heart. Another way of dropping the air pressure is you can just blow the horn. So I'm sure that campgrounds every morning before we get, would appreciate if we all got out there and tested our air brake systems in the morning. So, yeah, we can do it in harmony. <laughs> Seven o'clock, how's that sound? All right. 